Okay, so um, saving for retirement. Right now, let me guess, your income is somewhere between Jack and Squat, <laughs> right? Okay, so you're used to being poor, am I right? Okay, so here's my advice to you. When you get your job, you're going to be making more money than you've ever made in your life if you're a normal kind of MBA student. So here's what you do. First of all, max out your 401k contribution. And if you don't know what 401k is, just Google that. Max it out. And you want to max it out. And the, the reason you do is two reasons. Number one, you're not going to miss the money because as we've just figured out, you guys are poorer than dirt. Right? You're not going to miss that money. And number two, uh, what do we know about compounding and time? Oh, yeah. So it's, gonna, it's going to, uh, if the sooner you start, the more money you'll have. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the next thing is uh, you're going to get raises along the way. Instead of taking that money and blowing it on, say, better beer or whatever it is that you folks do, um, think about saving that additional money because once again you'll never miss it because you never had it before and if you follow those simple steps then you'll be in good shape when you get to be however old. By the way, raise your hand if you think Social Security is going to be there for you. Yeah, you know I'm not raising my hand either. So I, I, somehow I was born at the suckiest time because you know I've been paying Social Security my whole life but the year that I'm supposed to start drawing it is the year they say it will be going away. So isn't that great? Yeah. Anyway, so that's my advice for saving for retirement. Now, the other thing I will tell you is that I made a mistake in class the other day. I lumped normal and luxury goods together and inferior goods separate. Now, I was right about inferior goods. It has a price, you know, an income elasticity of demand of less than one. What does that mean? If your income's down 40%, maybe you're only down 10% on the amount of this product that you're going to demand. Let's say toilet paper, right? Um, but what if we have a product that, uh, that it goes exactly with your income? So if your income doubles, you will consume twice as much of this. I don't have any good examples of this thing right here. Uh, luxury goods, we know what those are. And uh, the demand for those climbs faster than your income. So, how about that? When you make, when you get a 10, per, if everybody got 10% more money, the demand for BMWs would go up by more than 10%. Does that make sense? Because it gives you that ability to move up from the Acura to the BMW. Okay, so that's, that's I wanted to straighten that out with you because I did mess that up the other day. Are there any questions? Okay, now let's get back to systematic risk and unsystematic risk. By the way, we talked about news and stock prices, and we said that news is what moves stock prices and that it's got to be unexpected news because if the news was expected, what has already happened to the stock price? Yeah, it's already priced that information in. That's one of the things we talk about in the efficient market hypothesis. By the way, efficient market hypothesis says that if you read in a newspaper about a new hot stock, can you go out after that newspaper, you know, you get the newspaper and you're like, oh, that's great, and then go out and put a trade and make above market return on that? No. In fact, the only time I did that, back when I was a stupid engineer, um, the only time I did that, the stock, uh, the company actually went bankrupt. So, yeah, good call. Okay, so uh, that was when I canceled my subscription to Business Week and we were done. Okay, so now let's talk about risk. Remember we said risk and return go together. And so far we've been using standard deviation as our measure of risk. But we need to be clear that that is total risk. Total risk. So standard deviation is a measure of total risk. And it turns out the market's not going to reward us for bearing all risk, just a certain kind of risk. And that certain kind of risk uh, that they're going to reward us for bearing are systematic risks. These are risks that influence a large number of assets, sometimes all assets. For example, um, 
Russia invades Ukraine. What happens to the price of oil? It increases. Yeah, it increased. Now, can you give me an example of any business at all that is not affected by an increase in oil prices? Now, I'm glad no one tried because if you had, I would have been able to tell you, well, you know, their stuff actually has to get to the store in a truck, right? Okay, so that's a systematic risk. And there are all sorts of systematic risks. There are ones involving the prices of commodities. There are ones involving financial decisions. Uh, the other day, the British said they were going to cut taxes. And it just it hit the financial markets all over the world. So there are these systematic risks, and they impact uh, everything. Then we have unsystematic risks. And these are things that only impact a few things. So I'll give you an example here of an unsystematic risk. Are you familiar with Will Fisher Distributing? Does anyone know what Will Fisher does? Yes. What do they do? Distributes beer for Anheuser-Busch. They distribute beer for Anheuser-Busch. And the reason I used, they were, uh, one of the students was in my class, he still works there, and <coughs> my wife and I take our Chinese students out there for tours of their facility, and then we get free samples. But that's, uh, of course, I don't drink on the job, right? Oh, back to, the students love it though. Back to the story. Will Fisher distribute. They have an area in which they are allowed to distribute beer. Now, if you go to the west, it's another distributorship. If you go to the east, it's another one. If you go north, it's another one. South, it's another one. Now, let's, and, and I'm not wishing this on anyone, but let's assume a giant sinkhole opens under the Will Fisher distributorship and swallows the whole thing. I assume there would be a large belch afterward because of all the, okay, back to the story. So, a sinkhole opens up, swallows the whole thing. Um, is that a systematic risk or an unsystematic risk? It's unsystematic because it's only affecting the one. And now, let's talk about why you can diversify away from such things. What do you think is going to happen if Will Fisher just poof, goes into the big sinkhole? Do you think uh, we're going to go thirsty in Springfield? No, what's going to happen? Yeah, do you think Anheuser-Busch would give those other distributors emergency ability to come in here and, and fulfill the needs of a thirsty and devastated Springfield? Absolutely. And not, if not, uh, is there another distributor here in town? Yeah, someone's got to put Miller Lite out, right? Cause the, the Will Fisher doesn't do that. And so what I'm telling you is, if you had a portfolio of all the beer distributors, would you really be impacted all that much by this sinkhole that swallowed the one? No, because the profits of the others are going to be up while the profits of Will Fisher is down. Does that make sense? Okay, let me give you a, a bigger idea on this, um, this, the reason that we can diversify away from some of these things. Let's talk about the movie, movie industry. What do you think determines the fluctuations in revenues at studios more? Economic conditions or whether the movie's any good? Oh, no. No. So think about this. Um, you know, you, you make Spider-Man, and, and the Spider-Man movie comes out, and you're like, I want to go see that. Do you, do you really think, eh, we may go into a recession in the spring. I don't know. No. Uh, in fact, strangely enough, movies do slightly better during times of recession. Anyone know why? Yeah, it's escapism. The same reason cheap alcohol does well. Okay, but it's minor. It's a minor effect. Well, it's a major effect. I'll give you some, ex ex some examples here. Uh, roll back to 1998, every woman I knew had seen Titanic about three times. <laughs> yeah. Jerk. Okay. Every woman I know has seen Titanic like three times. Titanic was at the time, I think, the biggest grossing film of all time. Of course, it's been surpassed since then. What do you think the revenues looked like at that studio at that time? Very good. Now, let's, uh, and I don't know if it's the same studio, but let's assume it is. And then, not long after that, they come out with Paul Blart, Mall Cop. 
Have you seen this? Yes. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> okay, what's my point in this? The revenues at a movie studio have a whole lot more to do with the, the blockbuster nature of the films that they're turning out than it does from economic conditions. Now, here's the next thing. Uh, do you think we've only got one movie studio? Now, this isn't North Korea. We've got more than one, right? What's that? We're getting there. We're, we're, yeah. Disney keeps buying. Consolidation, yeah. Oh, my. Okay. Yeah, pretty sad. So you guys need to go out and start a new movie studio. Yeah, okay. But keep in mind, though, we have new entrants into the movie-making business. Who are they? Netflix, Amazon, Hulu. So it's not it's not all going in the toilet like you think it might be. Okay. Ish. Like everything else. Yeah. Hulu's ish owned by Disney because it's actually uh, did they buy out the rest of it? I'm not sure. Okay. You need to check on that before you start making such sweeping statements. I'm just messing with you. Okay. Back to the story. Now let's think about this. At the same time that this movie th uh, studio is putting out Titanic, someone else is undoubtedly putting out, dude, where's my car? Have you guys seen that one? Oh my. Oh, it, it, Mr. Bowerrector, you're fortunate you've never seen that. Uh, it was, yeah, so, so what I can tell is, just from what the bit that I saw, is it could probably only be enjoyed with the accompaniment of a mind-altering substance, but we'll get so beyond that. Okay, so at the same time, but now here's the trick: Do you think every movie studio releases stinkers at the same time? No. Do you think they all release blockbusters at the same time? No. And so the revenues of these movie studios are uncorrelated. And so I could get rid of a whole lot of risk, this unsystematic risk of stinker or blockbuster, by just holding a portfolio of all the movie studios. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, the market knows that you can get rid of this risk. Now, and I'm talking about the market like it's a sentient being, but it's actually acting like a sentient being. But I'll explain how this works. If you think back to the very last statement I made in chapter four, which you were supposed to watch that video, and I doubt you did, but here it is. The price or value of anything is the present value of the expected future cash flows discounted at a rate appropriate to the risk. Now, present value, future value divided by one plus R to the T. If I am taking on the total risk, if I'm undiversified, and this is the only stock that I'm owning, I'm having to take on all of the risk. As a result, my demanded return will be higher, and I'll be willing to pay less for that stock. Does that make sense? It's worth less to me because I have to take on all this risk. Now, if everybody out there was only going to buy one stock, everything is still cool. Except for one thing. There are people like me out there who are well diversified. So I don't have to endure total risk. I only have to bear systematic risk. Now what does that mean? It means that I can accept a lower rate of return for owning the same asset because I'm not taking as much risk as you first stock buyers. Does that make sense? So as a result, what does that mean? It means I can pay more for the same asset because the risk is lower, my required return is lower, and I can pay more for that asset. And so if you think of the market as being basically a bidding war, who is always going to win the bidding war? The diversified investor. And that the risk that's getting priced in isn't the total risk, it's only the systematic risk. It's only the systematic risk. And that's why we say the market only prices in systematic risk. Now does that mean that you couldn't still go out there and buy that one stock? Of course you could. But you would not be getting a return high enough on that stock to pay for the amount of risk that you're taking. Does that make sense?
Of course you can go out there and buy it. People overpay for things all the time, right? But you're never going to win an auction against these people who can afford to pay based only on the systematic risk. And that's why stock prices only reflect systematic risk. And so we have some names here. Let's, let's talk about these. Systematic risk, we have another name for it. By the way, these are all names that get used interchangeably, say, in homework and test questions. Systematic risk, another name is market risk. Another name is market risk. Another name would be undiversifiable risk. Undiversifiable risk. Because we can't get rid of this stuff by diversifying. We can't get rid of it by diversifying. Then we have unsystematic risk. And unsystematic risk, I'm going to go ahead and write this one out for you. We also call it idiosyncratic risk. Idiosyncratic. There's your $7 word for the day, idiosyncratic. It used to be a 50 cent word, but inflation, you know how that works. Okay, idiosyncratic risk. Idiosyncratic means basically that it's not with the others. So uh, when we talk about someone exhibiting idiosyncratic behavior, I went to high school with a guy that walked into a McDonald's wearing no pants because the sign said no shirt, no shoes, no service. He went in and demanded service with no pants on, right? We would say he, but that behavior is idiosyncratic. Do you see a lot of people doing that? I should hope not, right? Okay. Idiosyncratic risk is the same thing as unsystematic risk. We may also hear it called firm-specific risk. Firm-specific risk would be another name for this. And you may also hear it called asset-specific risk. And then finally, we call this kind of risk diversifiable risk. Diversifiable risk. Because you can get rid of it through diversification. Just like buying all the movie studios or all the uh, beer distributorships. Okay, can someone tell me which of these can be diversified away? Unsystematic. It's actually on the slide, right? Which one of them are you stuck having to deal with? Systematic. Which ones do well-diversified investors uh, endure? Systematic. Which ones do people who only own one stock endure? All of them, right? And in fact, we could say, remember earlier I told you standard deviation is a measure of total risk. Total risk is just systematic plus unsystematic. The total risk is just the systematic risk plus the unsystematic risk. There are only two kinds. You add them together, that's your total risk. I say add them together. We're going to see mathematically we can't really do that. <clears throat> so let's talk about how the number of stocks impacts <coughs> diversification or the portfolio risk. And what happens here is some of my fellow uh, finance folks went out and they trained a computer. And they trained this computer to do what's called Monte Carlo something or other. Anyway, the idea is it's going to perform an experiment 10,000 times and then look at what's the average outcome. And so the first experiment they trained this computer to do was to pick one stock out of the entire population of stocks, hold it up, measure its standard deviation of returns, and then throw it back in the pond. And they did that 10,000 times. And then they took the average standard, average standard deviation of returns. And they found that it was 49.24%. It's 49.24%. Okay. Now they said, okay, thanks, computer. Now we're going to move on to, you're going to pull two stocks out. And you're going to form, and then two stocks totally random. You're going to form a portfolio that's half this one and half this one. And you're going to hold that portfolio up. You're going to measure the standard deviation. And you're going to do that 10,000 times. You're going to throw those back when you're done. You're going to do that 10,000 times. And you're going to tell me the average standard deviation for that two-stock portfolio. And the answer was 37.36%. And they keep doing this with more and more and more stocks till they generate this whole column of standard deviation of annual portfolio returns. Now, the next column over is a ratio of the standard deviation 
of the portfolio in question compared to this one asset portfolio. One asset portfolio. Now, uh, if we do the first one, of course, it's going to be 1.0, right? It's going to be 1.0 because it's comparing to itself. But the next one we can see is 0.76. In other words, I'm able to get rid of 24% of the risk simply by adding one stock to my portfolio. That's powerful. If I can, and this is on average. On average, if I add one stock to my portfolio, I can get rid of 24% of the risk. That's pretty amazing. Now, let's see what happens if we double again. We're going to go from two to four stocks. Now we see that ratio is down to 0.60. By just adding, by just adding three stocks to my portfolio over one, I've now gotten rid of 40% of the risk. Isn't that amazing? We've already gotten rid of 40% of the risk. We only have four stocks in our portfolio. Now, I want to point out to you that these stocks were selected at random. We'll get to what happens if they're not randomly selected here in a little bit. Okay, uh, now here's one thing I want you to notice though. As we doubled the first time, we got rid of 24%. As we doubled the next time, we went from 0.76 to 0.60, we only got rid of 16%. And forget 6, let's go to 8 up there, and now the next time we're down to 0.51, so we've gotten rid of 49% of the risk. But that last doubling, instead of getting us 24%, 16%, it's only getting us 9%. And so there is a diminishing benefit to adding additional stocks to your portfolio. In fact, if you're only interested in that ratio out to two decimal places, it looks like when we get down to about 200 stocks, we have achieved the overwhelming majority of the benefit, and now it's just like really tiny incremental returns or, or, or a benefit to adding more stocks. But I do want you to notice something. Does the standard deviation of the portfolio continue to go down? It does. It just has less and less and less of an impact as we add more and more stocks. And so we have this declining impact of adding additional stocks. Okay. So, if I ask you if you're going to go out and pick 200 stocks um, randomly, how many would you need to have a well-diversified portfolio? Based on the two-digit ratios here, I think it's about 200, right? Okay. So, let me tell you about my dad. My dad is a self-taught investor, and, but he's, and he's never had a class like this. But I was talking to him about his, his portfolio. And I said, how many stocks do you have in your portfolio? And he said, 12. I said, wow, you're terribly undiversified. And he said, but they're all electric utility companies. Does that help? <laughs> no, because we know, let's say, for instance, that tomorrow they outlaw coal. What's going to happen? <laughs> Every single one of his stocks is going to take a dive, right? Now, what he's saying is electric utilities aren't historically safe, and he's right. But you can have these things that would just knock out his entire portfolio. Now, I said, why won't you add more than 12 stocks? He says, 12 stocks is all that I can keep up with. I said, what do you mean? He says, well, he said, you know, if, you, if you're not watching the stocks every day, you could lose everything. I'm like, well, Dad, don't you think it, the news gets priced into the stock before you find out about it? And so my point to him is don't follow 12 stocks every day, which he does. Of course, he's 81. He's got very little else to do with his time. What, what, what do I do instead? I own at least 1,100 stocks. Do you think I follow each one of those every day? No. In fact, how often do you think I actually check my portfolio balance, if you had to guess. Monthly or quarterly. Uh, so he says monthly or quarterly. Weekly. Weekly. What, uh, anybody else have another guess? Twice a year. Ooh, twice a year. Uh, apparently, you guys think I'm more nervous than I am. <laughs> I only check it once a year. Wow. Oh, yeah. Now, so, so let's think about why that might be. 
I don't plan to retire for another 15 years. And all that checking it on a daily basis does is make you what? Anxious. Yeah, anxious. And sooner or later, your emotions get the best of you, like it did to my neighbor, and he sold out during COVID, and he hasn't got back in the market since. Now, it's starting to look like maybe he's going to get another chance to get back in where he got out. But my investing philosophy is I throw the same amount of money in every month. Every month. Month in, month out. Am I going to change that philosophy as a result of what yesterday's returns were? No. And so it really doesn't do me any good. The way that I invest is so much more relaxing than the way my dad invests because I don't follow the stocks and I'm not exposed to a lot of this risk that he is. Does that make sense? Okay. Do you think I'll ever convince him to invest my way? Absolutely not. Okay, now for you visual learners, let's put this, if these are the same numbers from that last chart, and we're going to talk about two things here, diversifiable risk and undiversifiable risk, and basically the line at the top, that curve, is total risk. The curve is total risk, remember we said total risk is standard deviation. And so we know that with one stock we've got 49.2 and then it starts to drop. And what we see is that this thing becomes asymptotal. Asymptotal. The total risk becomes asymptotal. What does asymptotal mean? Ms. Volkova, what does asymptotal mean? Oh, she's just, so she probably learned it in another language, right? I, I kind of know what it means, but I can explain Okay. Okay, an asymptote is a line. A line that a curve gets close to, but never quite touches. That's an asymptote. And if this curve is becoming asymptotal, it means it's approaching a line, but it never quite touches. It's like you're landing an airplane, and every quarter mile, you drop a further half the distance to the runway. If you keep dropping half the remaining distance, will you ever actually land the plane? No. You'll get closer, 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 but you never will quite get there. Total risk is asymptotal. And where does it almost land but not quite? On systematic risk. On systematic risk, not unsystematic risk. That blue area up there represents systematic risk, which is why it's labeled up there as non-diversifiable risk. What's another name for that diversifiable risk in the brown? Yeah, it's the unsystematic risk. We can get rid of that junk by diversifying our portfolio. By the way, um, my dad buys individual stocks one at a time and he pays a commission for every stock that he buys. You say, well, wait a minute. Wouldn't commissions kill you for owning 1,100 stocks? And the answer is no. I really only have to own two things in order to have 1,100 stocks in my portfolio. I have an S&P 500 uh, ETF. I have an S&P 600 ETF. Throw those two things together, I've got 1,100 stocks, and I only had to make two transactions to get there. Does that make sense? Okay. Questions? <clears throat> so let's talk about measures of risk. I've already told you, standard deviation is a measure of total risk, which is both unsystematic and systematic together. But the market's only concerned with systematic risk, and so what we need to do is get a measure of that. So we're going to develop this measure, and this measure is going to be called beta. And you can see beta is that curly B that the Greeks are fond of, beta. And we've already talked about why the market's only concerned with systematic risk. It's this argument right here. So let's talk about how we're going to get beta. Now keep in mind, last time we talked about the capital market line. That's the one that went from the risk-free asset to the market portfolio. Now we've got a second line to talk about. This is the characteristic line. And basically all we're doing to get our characteristic line is we're uh, plotting the returns of the security on the vertical axis and the returns of the market on the horizontal axis and that's going to form a line 
and the slope of that line is going to be beta. Do you guys know about slope? So slope is equal to the change in y over the change in x, or as my grandfather would have said, rise over run. That's slope. And so this slope relates the returns on the market to the returns on, or the returns on the stock to the returns on the market. In this case, the slope of this line is 1.5. What does that mean? It means that if the market's up by 1%, the stock's going to be up by 1.5%. Because after all, we're looking at the change in the uh, price of the stock divided by, or the change in the, yeah, change in the a return on the stock divided by the change in the return on, well anyway, uh, it's, it's comparing to the market. So, if we were looking at the market, what would the beta be? We'd be plotting the return to the market on the vertical and the horizontal. And so what would the slope of the line be? It'd just be one. So there's your first fun fact of the day. The beta of the market portfolio is one. The beta of the market portfolio is one. Okay, so basically anything with a beta greater than one is riskier than the market. Anything with a beta less than one is safer than the market. My dad's uh, electric utility stocks, where do you think their betas fall? Between zero and one or between one and three? Yeah, between zero and one. They're, they're relative, and that's what he means by that's okay, they're all electric utilities, is because the beta is low. By the way, if I tell you how beta works, and you say, well, wait a minute, if the market's up one and you got a beta of three, then the stock's up three. That's pretty cool. And if the market's up two, how much is my stock up? up six. Sweet! What's the downside? If the market's down. Yeah, if the market goes down 1%, what's your three beta stock doing? Six. Yeah, negative three. And if it's down 2%, you're down negative 6%. So, yeah, the, the big beta sounds all fun and games when we're in a bull market. And in fact, if you look at the time between COVID and very recently, what were people doing? They're piling into these high beta stocks because they think they're going to get rich and because they've only been investing during times of the market going up, it's all paying off for them, right? But what happens when the mar market goes down? They're in a world of hurt. By the way, the market's down like 25% from its peak. A beta, a three beta stock, how much is it down? 75%. Does that make sense? Okay, so high beta is all fun and games until the market starts to go down on us. Questions? Okay, so now let's talk about some betas for some uh, individual stocks. And the first one is one that my dad, I think my dad actually owns some of that. American Electric Power. It's an electric utility, 0.32. By the way, why do you think electric utilities are so safe from a systematic risk perspective? We rely very heavily on electric, and there's basically two kinds of electric consumption. There's residential, and there's industrial. Um, in the United States, which one of those do you think predominates? The residential, right? And, you know, it's not like when times are bad, you go home and sit in the dark, right? You're going to turn on your lights. You're going to, if this is a water company, you're going to flush your toilet, I hope. You're going to shower, maybe a little less. But the point is this, when you look at these utility companies, they are not going to be swayed by these big increases or decreases in economic growth. Now let's look on to Johnson & Johnson. What do they do? What do they make? Yeah. Medicine. Medicine. A lot of products. Say a lot of products. A lot of products. That doesn't help. Okay, so let's talk about bandages. Johnson & Johnson, I think they own Band-Aids, I think. Um, you, do, you, do you cut your finger and you're bleeding really a lot and you're like, you know, I'd love to put a Band-Aid on that, but I'm not sure I'm going to have a job tomorrow. 
Nobody thinks like that, right? And so that's why you see Johnson & Johnson being a low beta stock. And in fact, we might call it a defensive stock. During bad economic times, people would buy that stock. They would get out of these high beta stocks and into stocks like that. So are utilities, by the way. Well, then we've got Tyson Foods. Anybody know what Tyson Foods is really famous for? Chicken. Now, let's talk about chicken versus beef. Now, I know Tyson owns a beef processor, but let's just talk about chicken versus beef. It takes four pounds of grain to make one pound of chicken. It makes 10 pounds of grain to make one pound of beef. By necessity, which one's gonna be more expensive? Beef. Beef. Now, what does that mean? That means that during bad economic times, what kind of, of meat can people afford? Chicken. Chicken. And when times get good, they don't order more chicken, right? They, they migrate to beef. You don't ever hear anybody say, yeah, I just got a huge promotion. Tonight I'm going out for chicken and lobster. Hmm. Nobody says that. And so that's why Tyson, predominantly a chicken company, has such a low beta. And then there's Allstate. What does Allstate do? Insurance. Insurance. And they're getting closer to being uh, risk, the same risk as the market. By the way, what was the beta for market? One. One. So everything we've talked about so far is less risky than the market. Now, let's move on to uh, 3M. 3M is an industrial conglomerate. They make all sorts of different stuff. It makes all the sense in the world that they're basically as risky as the overall market. They're basically a huge diversified portfolio of very middle of the road stuff. So it makes sense. What about Hewlett Packard and Dell? What do they do? Computers, right? Okay, so let me tell you how computer upgrades work. When times are tough, what do companies say about replacing their computers? Nothing. Yeah, they just they put a hold on that. And then when times are good, then they'll go ahead and do the upgrade. And so that means that these, these stocks are more sensitive to the economy than, say, toilet paper. Does that make sense? In fact, I remember working at the nuclear plant. We showed up one day, and there were these, like, pallets of brand new Dell computers. And we're like, what happened? And they said, well, we had a good year, and we had some money left over, so we went out and bought computers. Does that make sense? Okay. And then finally, the last one here is an outlier. And the reason it's an outlier is because the time frame of this snapshot, I forget what year the snapshot was, but it was, it was after the financial crisis. After the financial, so during the financial crisis, AIG nearly went out of business. The stock price just <laughs> crashes. The US government steps in and bails them out. And eventually they get their money back plus make a profit. But they had to bail them out, so the stock price is very, very low. And then, uh, when things start to return to normal and AIG gets back into its regular business of insurance, the stock price starts to go up pretty fast. Is it going up fast because AIG is growing, or, or this is all, is it very risky? No, it's going up because it's basically returning to its previous situation. I don't know if you've ever been in a swimming pool and you drag a float down to the bottom, something that floats, and then you let go, what happens? It goes whoop, and it goes up. It gets really fast, right? Um, what if you're just holding it slightly below? The, the speed doesn't build like that. So what we were seeing there is that AIG was just basically going back up to where it should have been, and that's why it shows such a high beta. In fact, I'll bet if we went out today and looked at AIG's beta, it would not be that high. Now there is an important thing down here at the very bottom. And that is a definition of beta that you should surely have on your note sheet. It's a definition of beta that you should surely have on your note sheet. And it's the covariance Covariance of the returns on your stock with the returns on the market divided by the variance 
on the market. Now, if you remember that we had a correlation is equal to covariance divided by standard deviation of returns on the market standard deviation. So this is how we can do correlation. What if you're given correlation in a problem? What can you do? You can rearrange this and say covariance the returns of the return of stock with the returns on the market is rho times the standard deviation of returns on the stock and the standard deviation of returns on the market. And so then I can plug that in here. And it would just be correlation like that. Have I done anything mathematically illegal? It's just substitution principle. Now, here's the cool thing. What happens? Did I do anything illegal? No. And so what we've got here is correlation times the standard deviation of returns on the stocks divided by the standard deviation on the market. Now, if you're the kind of person that can't do that algebra during an exam, write this one down too. Does that make sense? And keep in mind, this is correlation and this is covariance. You have to read to know what they've given you. Questions? By the way, we keep talking about the returns on the market, and theoretically it should be that market portfolio, but we do not know the true market portfolio. We talked about that last time. So what do we use as our stand-in instead? We use the S&P 500. We typically use the S&P 500 for our returns on the market. Okay, now let's talk about calculating beta for a portfolio. It turns out it's just like calculating expected returns. So all you have to do is the weighted average of the betas gives you the beta of the entire portfolio. The weighted average of the betas gives you the beta for the entire portfolio. And so it's going to look something like this. Beta of the portfolio is equal to XA beta A plus XB beta B plus dot 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 plus XN beta N. And the sum of uh, the sum of the X's is going to have to equal to 1. So that's I is equal to 1 to N. So you're going to have to add all those x's together, and they always add to 1. The weights always add to 1. Now, this is just like what we've been talking about for finding the return of a portfolio. Previously, we said you couldn't do the weighted average of the standard deviations. That's a measure of risk. Why is it OK to do the weighted average of the betas? Isn't it also a measure of risk? The reason we couldn't do the weighted average of the standard deviations was because those contain unsystematic risk that can be diversified away. Can beta be diversified away? No. And so that's why it's just the weighted average. It's just the weighted average. Very simple. Now we're on to our third line that we're going to talk about today. The first was the capital market line from last time. Then the characteristic line, now we're on to the security market line. And the security market line, just like some other lines we've looked at previously, has expected return on the vertical axis, and it has risk on the horizontal axis. Previously, this risk measure has been standard deviation, but now this risk measure is going to be beta. The risk measure now is beta. And we are going to construct this line using two things that we know. By the way, a line, in case you were asleep in high school geometry, you can draw a line through any two points that are not like one on top of another, right? And so all we need to define this line are two points. And the two points that we know
two points that we know are the market portfolio and the risk-free asset. And we will talk about X and Y for these both. Okay, now the market portfolio. We said, what's the, what's the beta of the market portfolio? One. One. What's the beta of the risk-free asset? The beta of the risk-free asset. Zero. If it's risk-free, <laughs> zero. zero. Very good. Okay. Now, over here on Y, it's not quite as easy. We're going to say that this is the expected return on the market portfolio. And the return on the risk-free asset will be the risk-free rate. Okay, so now we have two data points. Two data points. All I need to define a line are two points. Okay, now um, I'm going to show you a formula. If you're an American, this formula looks like this. If you were trained outside of the US, it probably was like this. Was this how it was for you, the second one? Okay. What is that? Oh, you're getting close. Start. The slope, slope intercept form of the line. It's the slope intercept form of the line. Now, what is B in that formula? The y intercept. The y intercept is defined as the value of y when x is zero. Do we know what that is? Yeah, it's just the risk free rate, isn't it? So basically, all we have to do now is figure out the slope of that line. That thing's crazy. Okay. The slope of the line. How am I going to do that? Slope is equal to y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. And just to make it come out pretty, I'm going to call this number 2 and this number 1. And it's just because I want that stuff to come out positive. If I did it the other way, both would come out negative, and what would happen to the negatives? Yeah, they just cancel out. So we're going to get the same answer either way. So, um, let's see, y2 minus y1 is the expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate divided by y, uh, x2 minus x1, 1 minus 0. So what is 1 minus 0? 1. And if I divide by 1, what do I get? I just get the, the top part, right? And so basically what we're left is, this is the slope of the security market line. We have another name for this thing. It's the MRP, the market risk premium. The market risk premium. Remember earlier we said a risk premium is the expected return on something minus the risk-free rate. Well, the market risk premium is the expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate. And so, and this is a great test question, what is the slope of the security market line? It is the market risk premium. Now, what is the most common answer students put down for what is the slope of the security market line? They say it's beta. Most common wrong answer is beta. By the way, do you think I would have that in there too? Absolutely, because I am that cruel. Okay, so I'm going to say it one more time. The slope of the security market line is the market risk premium. So now we can go ahead and put all of this stuff together to come up with a statement of the security market line. In this case, y is going to be the expected return on the stock, which is that horizontal or a vertical axis, is equal to, what's the slope? Expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate. And what are we multiplying that by? What's x? 
beta. And so that's going to be the beta on the individual stock. See, it's stock I, beta I. And then we're going to add the y-intercept, which we said was the risk-free rate. And so there is your security market line. However, typically, we state this a little differently. We say it's the expected return on security I is equal to, and we start with the risk-free rate, plus, and then sometimes we see beta first, expected return on the market, minus the risk-free rate. Are those mathematically identical? Yeah, they're mathematically identical. You can put either one of them on there on your sheet that you wanted to. Now, here's something I want to point out. This thing here is the market risk premium. When you're working problems involving this, you always want to read. Are they giving me the expected return on the market, or are they giving me the market risk premium? Because if they're giving you the market risk premium, you don't have to subtract out the risk-free rate. If they aren't giving you, if they are giving you the expected return on the market, you have to subtract that out before you multiply by beta. Does that make sense? What you also notice, the risk-free rate shows up twice in the equation. Okay. Now, let's talk about something else that I think is interesting. And that is, what happens if we subtract the risk-free rate from both sides? This is what we get. And this thing is just the um, risk premium for the stock. So, if you want to know the risk premium for the stock, all you got to do is take the beta and multiply it by the market risk premium. And so, if a stock has a beta of 3, its risk premium is going to be three times as much as that of the market. And that makes perfect sense because we know risk and reward have to go together. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, let's go back and talk about different kinds of betas. I'm going to put this back the way it was. <clears throat> we said that the beta of the risk-free asset <coughs> is zero. If I plug beta of zero into this, what do I get? Yeah, the expected return is just the risk-free rate. Does that make sense? Sure does. Now, what if we have the market portfolio? What's the beta of the market portfolio? One. If I put a one in here, I get risk-free rate plus the expected return on the market minus the risk-free rate. What happens to the risk-free rate minus the risk-free rate? cancels out and the expected return of that item would be the expected return on the market, which would be exactly what we would expect. If beta is greater than one, it's going to return more than the market. If beta is less than one, it's going to return less than the market. Now, I don't recall in this particular edition of your textbook what they say, but I used to have one and it's talked about negative beta stocks and it gave some examples. And then the very next edition that came out said there's no such thing as negative beta stocks, which I thought was very interesting given what the last one had said. And so I thought, well, maybe negative beta stocks have disappeared from existence. And so what did I do? I go out to my stock screener that my broker gives me for free, right? And I tell them I want to see all stocks with betas less than zero. And the kinds of stocks that showed up were gold mining stocks. Let's talk about why gold mining stocks might have a negative beta. When do people buy gold? When do people just really start jumping into gold? Is it during good times or bad times? Bad times, people are, are flying into gold. So what does that mean? It means as the market is taking a dump, what's happening to gold, happening to gold prices? They're rising. They're rising. Okay, that's the first step. 
Second step, think about a gold mining operation. Here we have, we've got our mountain that we've been digging gold out of, and we're getting 100 kilograms a day. Oh, that would be a lot of gold. We're getting 100 grams a day out of this mine, and uh, it really, I mean, we're paying our people $20 an hour, and we have to spend so much on electricity, but our costs really do not vary with the price of gold, do they? I mean, we've already bought the mountain. Yeah. Okay, now think about what the profits look like at a gold mining company. Because the costs are staying pretty stable, as the price goes of gold goes up, what happens to the profits? Whew, yeah. And what happens if the price of gold goes down? Profits go down. And so the profits of the gold mine just basically directly go up and down with the price of gold. So follow the bouncing ball. The market's in bad shape, gold prices go up, gold mines are more profitable. At the same time, when the economy is bad, what's going on with the market? Oh, come on, if the, if the economy is doing poorly, do you think we're all having a party on Wall Street? No. No, it goes the other way, right? So if the market, if the economy's bad, the market's down, and so it's both driven by the economy, the market's down, the gold mining stocks are up. They're moving in the opposite direction. Now, what happens when we start to get a little hope, when things start to get better? Do people want to hold on to their gold? No, and so they start to sell their gold to buy stock. What happens to the price of gold? It goes down. What happens to the price of stock? It goes up. It goes up, and so we're seeing these things move in opposite directions. So, I have proven to you that negative beta stocks exist, and now I'm going to ask this question, what happens if beta is negative here? What happens to that expected return on that stock? It's negative. It's, uh, well, it's not necessarily negative, but it's definitely less than the risk-free rate. Now, why on earth would I put up with a stock that offered me less than the risk-free rate when I could just invest my money in the risk-free asset? And the answer is, when these stocks pay off. So, in good times, the markets, the economy's up, the market's up, and your portfolio is bigger at the same time that you're getting pay raises at work. This growth in your portfolio is certainly nice, but is it going to make the difference between you eating and you not? No. What about during bad economic times? Your, uh, the, so the market's down, your, um, your dog left, your pickup truck broke down. There's all sorts of bad, bad, bad things that go on there. Song? What's that? Probably a country it song. It could be. Oh, by the way, <laughs> with the invention of self-driving cars, it's only a matter of time before we had a country song about a man's pickup truck leaving him. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the story. We're talking. Oh, okay. So, uh, then, so, but the, the question is this What are your negative beta stocks doing when all these bad things are going on in your life? Yeah, they're going up. Let's see, I've got, I'm going to have to ask for some help from my economists here. It's diminishing marginal utility of consumption. Does that sound familiar? I think that's the class that I took during COVID. What's that? <laughs> I think that's the class that I took during COVID. Oh, okay. Okay, so I'll give you just a really, I won't, and of course you're not going to have to know the term. It's a diminishing, diminishing marginal utility of consumption. So here's the trick. When you're very poor, the very next dollar that you earn, does it mean a lot to you or a little? A lot. A lot. Now, what about the next dollar? Does it mean quite as much as the first dollar? A little less. A little less, right? And so what we're saying here is the higher your income gets, the less that additional dollar means to you. I'll give you an example. The year's 1989. I'm in my dorm room with my buddy Derek. Derek's dad was a big deal civil engineer for an oil company. And he comes to our room and we're sitting around complaining about the price of books. And we complained about a book being $100. I know you guys are going to laugh that a $100 book costs us to complain because that's like on the low end for you, right? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we're complaining about this $100 book. And he says, his name is Earl, by the way. Earl said, I piss $100 up against the wall. <laughs> now, I thought two things. Number one, easy for you to say because you make $55,000 a year, which was big money in 1989. And the other thing that I thought was, piss my way. Right? Because that hundred dollars meant a whole lot more to me than him. Why did it mean more to me than him? Because I didn't. I had somewhere between Jack and Squat, right? Does that make sense? Now, that's why we are willing to put up with bad behavior from these negative beta stocks because they pay off when we're hungry, cold, our life partner has less left us, the dog has rabies, all the bad things in life, right? Questions? And we've talked about all that. And now we're on to finding, doing linear regression on Excel. Now, by the way, is this something I can ask you to do during the exam? No. No. Does that mean you shouldn't? Stop that. <laughs> Does that mean you shouldn't pay any attention? Stop that. No, you should pay attention because I'm going to be teaching you some stuff as we go along here. Okay, now, uh, so let's let's take this. Uh, oh, I already erased it. We're going to take the formula in this format. And in doing this, in linear regression, our intercept is going to be. Zero. So now I'm graphing the risk premium of the stock versus the risk premium on the market. Now, the stock we're going to work with is General, <coughs> General Electric. The risk-free rate we're going to be work with, working with is the three-month U.S. Treasury bill. Now, where did I get the data for three-month Treasury bill yields? From our friends at the Federal Reserve. By the way, there are 12 Federal Reserve banks. What is the only state to have two? Missouri. Missouri. So if, if you ever need a point of pride for Missouri, there you go. We have two Federal Reserve banks. Okay. So I got that data from the Federal Reserve, and I went out to Yahoo Finance and got the prices from GE. Now, uh, Yahoo does very little well anymore, but this is one of the few things they do well, and that is historical stock data. As long as the company is still surviving, it's out there. And so I was able to pull that data. And then I can use the prices on GE to figure the return. Because we know that the return is just equal to PT plus 1 minus P sub T divided by T sub T. Does that look familiar? That's all I did to come up with this return on GE. In fact, I'll click on it and you can see which cells I used. By the way, notice that these are in descending date. In other words, the very last date is the one at the end. Now, I want you to notice that I have gone all the way down here and my last price that I pulled was not in 2007. Oh my goodness, I feel old. This has been a long time since I pulled this data. Um, it wasn't in 2007, it was in 2006. Any idea why? In order to cal I'll get you started. In order to calculate the return for today, what do I need to know about yesterday? I've got to know yesterday's price, right? <coughs> and so in order to be able to figure out this return right here, I had to know yesterday's price. And, and in this case, yesterday means the last trading day. Does that make sense? By the way, typically 252 trading days and a year, unless we have a weird year or a terrorist attack. That's, that's the only two things I can think of that have led to differences. Did you guys know that we, turned, we shut down the stock market during the 2001? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Now, back up here. Now I need, so I've got the return on GE. I can figure out what is this risk premium on GE by subtracting out the risk-free rate. So all I have to do is take the return on the stock and subtract out that risk-free rate. Nothing major exciting there. Okay, now the next thing I need to know is uh, I need a proxy 
for the market portfolio. A proxy is a stand-in, a substitute. It's not perfect, but it's the closest that we can get, or it's at least one that we all agree on. And uh, the proxy we typically agree on is the S&P 500. Now, the day that I was out there pulling this data down, for the life of me, I could not find the S&P 500 in Yahoo Finance. But I could find SPY. Does anybody know what SPY is? <coughs> It's an exchange traded fund that represents the S&P 500. So if the S&P 500 is up 10%, this thing's up 10%. If the S&P 500 is down 2%, this thing's down 2%. Does that make sense? And so the returns on this thing are gonna be the same as the returns on the S&P 500. So that's what I did. I grabbed it and I did exactly the same things with it that I did with GE. And so now I have the market risk premium, which is this column, and I have the risk premium on the stock, which is that column. So I've got this piece, and I've got this piece, and I'm gonna use something called linear regression to determine this piece. Have you guys done linear regression before? Oh, wow, excellent. Usually people have never heard of it. Okay, now, linear regression, by the way, it's all about minimize, it's about creating a line that fits the data the best, right? So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to create a line that fits the data the best. Now, how do I do that in Excel? First thing I do is I go out here to data, and I see that they don't have the thing that I need, so I, which is not uncommon, I go to what, home, no, there we go, and I go down here to options, where's options? Under what? Oh, more. Uh. Okay, so now what else do we have under options? We have add-ins. And what add-ins do we need here? Uh, so we're going for the analysis tool pack. I don't know the difference between this one and this one. I always just take the top one. And, but I can go down here and manage Excel add-ins and say go and just click on analysis tool pack and then go back to data. And there it is, woo! Okay, now I double click on that, and it gives me some choices. And there's all sorts of amazing stuff to do there, but the one we're interested in is regression. And they're telling me to input the Y range. Y in our equation is this, the risk premium on the stock. And so I'm gonna start over here. I'm gonna go all the way down. What is that noise? Okay, and then I'm gonna go over and input the X range, which is this thing over here. And I'm just gonna say as a new worksheet page, so I'm just gonna hit okay. And then we'll try to look these things over and see what we can, how we can interpret them. Okay, first thing I want to look at is R squared. Do you guys know what R squared is? Okay, so it has to do with how well does this line fit my data. And in fact, what we're saying here is that I can explain 60%, 0.6L, I can explain 60% of the change in this based on the change in this. Now, you may think that an R-square of 0.6 sounds low, but in, when I was in engineering school, we were looking for 0 0.97, 0 0.98. But we were dealing with physical phenomena. What we're dealing with here is, by the way, finance is a social science. Everything we're looking at here is as a result of interactions between people. Do you think people are as predictable or dependable as, say, cast iron? Nope. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And so uh, it's, it's not strange to me to see 0.6. In fact, when you start looking at the correlation coefficients on some of the, or the, the R squareds, on some of the big studies that we all hang our hats on, how many of you think uh, smoking cigarettes causes lung cancer? Yeah, we all do, right? You know what the R squared on that study was? 0. 0.04, 0. 0.05. Right? Yeah, I'm not telling you to go out and smoke, it's still bad for you, plus it makes you stink. Don't do that, it makes your teeth yellow too. 
Okay, so what I'm telling you is 60% is a victory. 60% is actually a victory here. Okay, now we're going to move on down here. And there is this thing called the F test. And the, uh, so, so the significance of the S te F test, basically, uh, we also call this P value if, so there's a, uh, that's the probability that this thing we've come up with, this beta we're calculating, is actually zero. Now, how do I read that number? That's scientific notation. It's point zero 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 fifty zeros. Two. Is that is that a high probability that you'd like to bet money on? No, no that's a damn near never going to happen kind of probability, right? Does that make sense? That's like winning the lottery kind of probability. Okay, so uh, we, we're pretty sure that this thing has uh, has some significance to it. Now, when we get down to the bottom, x variable one is this. And it's calculated as 0.894. That would be the beta for GE at that time, 0.894. Now, what's the, the uh, beta of the market? One, GE, lar at the time, large industrial conglomerate in many different businesses. Does it make sense that they have a beta close to that of the market? Absolutely, it does. Now, let's talk about the, this intercept. Remember, I told you this intercept should be zero. Let's see how close to zero we got. That intercept says negative seven times 10 to the negative fifth. So here's what that would be. Point zero, 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 seven. Is that pretty close to zero? Yeah, I think so. And so it actually worked out fairly well. Our, our intercept was very, very close to zero. So I would say that we have a successful estimation of, of our uh, beta here. Now, should we take this number as an exact number that we should always No. What is this thing, actually? Four-letter acronym starts with an S. What is it? Swag. It's a swag. Right? It's a swag. Because look at the, look at the R squared. There's basically a 60% chance this thing is right. Does that make sense? I mean, that's, that's oversimplifying it, but the idea is this. If that R squared was 1.0, we could take this to the bank, but otherwise it's a swag. It's not necessarily gonna be exactly that. Questions? Okay, I managed to finish chapter 11 today. And so now you need to go do your homework, and if you have questions, let me know.